Member for Oak Bay Gordon Head. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Um, I'm wondering, with respect to the implementation of this, uh, what timeline the uh, government is thinking that uh, LNG facilities will start to develop and whether or not they expect any LNG facility to actually uh, trigger a compliance period before 2020. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We anticipate, in terms of implementation, we anticipate having regulations uh, completed and drafted uh, late 2016, early 2017. Uh, with respect to the member's other question around the likelihood of operations being in place, uh, I'll leave that for the Minister of Natural Gas Development and we'll retain our role as uh, the regulator. Member. So, Honourable um, Chair, my question back to the, to the uh, Minister is this. So, legislation will be ready, regulations will be ready 2016, 2017, say. So, does the Minister expect there to be an LNG facility taking up these regulations before 2020? It's a very clear question. These regulations would not be put in place if there was not a very uh, specific reason to put them in place. The specific question is, why are we doing this now? Who is coming? And what is the timeline by which government thinks an LNG facility will make a final investment decision such that these regulations will be triggered? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as uh, the regulator, I'm not involved in discussions uh, with respect to final investment decisions um, that industry players may make. Uh, we have seen, in terms of the realm of approvals, uh, we know that Tilbury is uh, certainly uh, on its way. We know that wood fibre has uh, received both a certificate from ourselves and also from the federal government. We don't know what the federal government position is going to be uh, with respect to PNW, but uh, again, we operate from the regulatory side in terms of what decision making um, is occurring around boardroom tables. That's not uh, in my purview. Member. Thank you, Honourable Chair. So the answer was um, clearly that a senior minister within government doesn't really know. So that leads me to the next question, then, Honourable Speaker, is if the government is putting in place regulations along this line and is expecting, perhaps, maybe, but we don't really know, some proponents to take it up, my question is this. Will the minister be introducing legislation to repeal the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Targets Act this session? Because if anybody takes this up, they will need to do that. Minister. Uh, Mr. Chair, I apologize. I, I was listening, but I don't quite understand what the member is asking about repealing. Member. Clarify. Um, if a proponent were to take up this new legislation and the compliance period were to be enacted or a trans transitional compliance period were to be entered into, then we know that the 2020 greenhouse gas reduction target that is a matter of law in British Columbia that we are to reduce emissions by 33% will not be possible. So my question is, in introducing this legislation, it's critical that the government introduce parallel legislation to repeal the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Targets Act, which is currently a matter of law. And the question to the minister is this, when will she be re introducing legislation to repeal the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Targets Act? Because you can't have your cake and eat it too. You introduce this, you repeal that. When will that be occurring? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's no intention at this stage uh, to introduce such legislation, and here's why. Uh, firstly, uh, the member knows from the Climate Leadership Team report that we're well aware that we are not on track to meet our 2020 targets. Uh, that's no surprise. It's something that myself, the Premier, uh, we've spoken about many times in public. 
But we've also talked about um, the importance of considerations around the current climate leadership team's recommendations. Those recommendations are modeled uh, on the premise of having two operating LNG facilities, um, newly operating in British Columbia. Now, they present a very challenging set of recommendations, uh, but those recommendations are being wrestled with. But to the question of is the answer then to not meeting the 2020 target, is the answer then to repeal the legislation, the best example I can provide is what happens um, when there are challenges faced in the world of budgeting. We have a law in British Columbia that requires us to balance the budget. When we don't manage to do that, and occasionally that occurs, it certainly occurred um, when we had the financial downturn most recently, uh, we don't repeal the balanced, balanced budget legislation. Um, we have to work to get back on track. Um, so how will we address the existing 2020 target in law? Uh, I, I'm not aware of any decision with respect to that having been uh, reached. Uh, it's something that we will have to determine um, as we proceed with our new climate action plan. Member. Um, thank you, Honourable Chair. It's not only the 2020 target, Honourable Chair, it's the 2050 target, and with respect through you to the Minister, you cannot meet the 80% reduction by 2050 with two large LNG plants. It's, unless everybody in the province of British Columbia simply stops driving cars, it is factually incorrect to argue that you can. And the Climate Action Team did not say that you could. So the reality is that these targets need to be repealed. The reality is, Honourable Chair, is this government is misleading British, British Columbians inadvertently maybe, I wonder, and honourable chair, this government needs to be honest. It needs to be honest with them that this legislation, continuing the generational sellout, is essentially throwing aside our plans to reduce greenhouse gases by yet another loophole, the transition period. If any proponent were to take up this transition period and have a free reign essentially on greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions, the 2020 target is out, out of the window. The government has yet to say what they're going to do with greenhouse gases to meet some other 2020 target. The government has no plan on greenhouse gas reductions. The government is full of hot air about the climate file. And the government is an embarrassment internationally in terms of what it has not done anymore on the climate action file. So my question to, the to you, to the minister, one last time is, when does the government believe that proponents of LNG will actually make final investment decisions, and is the government actually stalling any climate leadership because it's worrying to, waiting to see whether or not an LNG facility will come or not? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, a lot to cover there. Firstly, there is no free ride. There is no free ride. They will still have to monitor and report and be responsible and pay for their emissions over that time period. The first reporting period is simply allowed to extend for a maximum of six months more. There you go. That's, that's all the magic in it. They don't get a free ride. Um, with respect to the uh, climate leadership team's uh, recommendations, uh, they're there for all to see and they certainly uh, would put us on a path to meeting our 2050 targets. Um, and they do include the operation of LNG facilities. Um, we also had, um, in terms of our climate file, um, some rather good news just delivered to us, and it was a little unexpected because we know uh, that our trajectory recently has been more challenging in emissions. Um, but our, the April 14th, I believe, the uh, National Inventory Report came out and actually showed um, that we have seen a slight decline uh, in our emissions. So that's a positive. But we still have an awful lot of work to do. The fact is, though, that this change, the new entrant period, uh, does not change the obligations that these companies have to comply um, with their requirements. Uh, I know the member um, certainly is not supportive of the industry, and that's fair enough. But it's wrong to say that what this does is give companies a free ride. It does not. Member. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I've never said I'm not supportive of the industry. What I have said is I'm not supportive of hype and giving away a generational uh, resource to foreign uh, international companies at essentially no benefit to British Columbians. Honourable Speaker, my question on this topic then directly to the Minister is, which reporting are you talking about for fugitive emissions? The federal number 
or the BC number, because they don't match. Are you talking about the National Inventory Fugitive Emissions or the BC Fugitive Emissions? Because this is a, a, nobody quite knows when the BC government talks about emissions reductions, which one number are they using? Because the numbers don't match up. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In this case, I'm not talking about uh, simply the emissions from uh, fugitive emissions. I'm talking about the National Inventory Report with respect to British Columbia's overall emissions. Member. But that number to the, through to the minister depends on an overall reduction based on a number of which one of those numbers is fugitive emissions, Honourable Chair, and the fugitive emission number federally is different from the number used provincially. So my question through you to the chair is which number is the right number and which number does the province use when it's actually doing its calculations in terms of greenhouse gas reductions? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, the member will know that this has been a long-standing uh, problem, not just for British Columbia, but for other provinces as well. Um, there are a different uh, set of numbers that are utilized by the federal government, by various provinces. In fact, um, it is one of the important pieces of work that is being undertaken currently within the federal process. Um, our officials meeting with federal officials, it's happening uh, between other uh, provinces and the federal government as well to arrive at a standard means by which um, we can measure and report emissions across all sectors. But in this case, what I was pointing to is completely the federal numbers and their report that shows we've seen a slight decrease recently um, in our emissions. Member. Thank you, Honourable Chair. So the Minister just admitted that the Minister does not know which overall number should be used in discussing emissions reductions. So in essence, what we're hearing, Honourable Speaker, is the Ministry is essentially saying we don't know what we're redu reducing because we don't know what number we should use. So my question to the Minister through you, Honourable Chair, is when are we going to have the answer to this? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the difference between the two um, is based on the fact that the federal government has a different threshold uh, for reporting, for one. Um, theirs is 50,000, ours is 10,000. Therefore, we capture more of the data, uh, which is likely the reason why it appears we have more accurate um, information with respect to our emissions uh, from these facilities um, than the federal government would have. Uh, their data set doesn't capture those below 50,000, so they then uh, must project uh, what those might be. Now, um, it's, it's a recognized problem, has been for some years, uh, and we're hopeful that through the current process um, in which we're involved with the federal government that that will be resolved. I know we've made significant progress discussing this at the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment. Member. Thank you. So just to summarize then, the Minister has talked about the climate leadership team's recommendations and the climate leadership team's recommendations apparently, not what I read, will allow for two large LNG facilities to come in place. I guess we'd all have to have negative emissions, everyone else. Um, but let's, let's come to that, Honourable Chair, because the climate leadership team recommended a $10 per year increase in the carbon tax every single year. 
So, Honourable Speaker, my question to you, to the Minister, then, is if the, if, the gov if the Minister is going to evoke the climate team's response, is the Minister here today willing to say that she accepts the $10 per tonne increase in price of carbon, and does she not think that this will immediately preclude any LNG industry from existing in BC? Can she look British Columbians in the face, Honourable Chair, and say that we support $10 per tonne increase in, in emissions pricing, and we honestly think that an LNG facility will develop here in BC? Does the Minister honestly think she can have her cake and eat it too? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and no surprise uh, to the member. Um, I'll save pronouncements on uh, taxation activities related to the carbon tax uh, for the time when we're debating that bill in committee. Member. Well, thank you, Honourable Chair. Just to clear up the record for British Columbians who are riveted at their TV screen today, the answer is simple. You cannot increase carbon tax $10 per ton per year and expect there to be an LNG industry. The reality is you can't, unless you exclude all LNG emissions. So the reality is, Honourable Chair, is we are witnessing yet another emperor with no clothes. So it's just about time, frankly, Honourable Chair, that British Columbians be levelled with honestly, that we cannot have climate leadership and an LNG industry, and until such time as this minister levels correctly, honestly, with British Columbians, they will continue and remain to have zero credibility on the climate file. Thank you. I call the, um, the members to order that uh, withdraw the dishonest. This intervention. Oh. Member for Oak Bay Gordon. What, what Basically, am I you are saying that the, the minister is not honest. I didn't say that. I said levels to be honest with British Columbians. I didn't call anybody dishonest. I said until such time as the minister is honest with British Columbians. That is quite different, Honourable Chair. And I challenge your ruling there. Uh, so I caution the member in the future to be more careful on yeah. using the parliamentary language. Thank you.